Good morning, everyone. My name, as Dr. Allen said, is Danielle Dorfman, and I'm representing Design Team 4. And we are presenting our design for a minimally invasive skin biopsy device for skin conditions in the epidermis. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Dr. Kang, as well as our physician mentors, Drs. Taub, Garza, and Chen, for helping us throughout this process. So just to give you a bit of perspective, the top image shows you the basic anatomy of the skin. You have the epidermal, dermal, and hypodermal layers. Um, for our device, we focus on the epidermis layer and the skin conditions that were most prevalent in this layer, which are depicted below. The first is seborrheic keratosis, which are um, wart-like growths that are benign, but patients like to get these removed for cosmetic reasons. The second is actinic keratosis, which are rough, flaky lesions that are often precancerous. So it's really important to get these detected early. Finally, you have basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common form of cancer in the United States. There are over 800,000 new cases per year. And again, it's really important to get these detected early um, to prevent it from spreading to other surrounding tissue. So let's say you have a suspicious lesion on your skin and your doctor needs to diagnose it. He or she will most likely use the current standard of care, which you can see here is a curved razor blade that is used to cut the skin. This method is obviously very crude and dangerous to doctors as they cut directly towards their resting hand. Not only that, but there's very little control of depth and so they take a lot more sample than what is necessary for pathological diagnosis. But most importantly to you as the patient, you have a 67% chance of getting a scar from this procedure. Um, because there's very little depth control, the doctor often hits the dermal layer. And when this happens, he hits blood vessels and nerve endings, which causes excessive scarring and bleeding. So would you risk getting a scar for a condition that you might not even have? Well, to answer this question, we realize that there is a need for a skin biopsy device that could reduce scarring and bleeding um, protect the doctor from razor cuts, but still maintain a sufficient sample for diagnosis. So to translate this into engineering terms, um, we would like to remove about 0.3 millimeters in depth of the skin, which is about the depth of the epidermis. We'd like to eliminate the open blade to avoid exposure to the physician, and we'd like to obtain a sample of about 4 millimeters by 4 millimeters, which is shown in the image above, uh, which is the minimum amount required for pathological diagnosis. So this is our design solution for the skin biopsy device. Um, this, there are three unique features to our device that um, really make it stand out. So the first is the rotating spherical blade, the second is the visiting visibility window, and the third is the hole which you can see in the center picture that's about four millimeters in diameter. So when you put all these features together, you get our skin biopsy device. Um, the doctor uses the visibility window to line up the lesion with the hole at the bottom of the device. Now this hole restricts the rotating spherical blade from cutting any more than what is necessary for pathological diagnosis. So this is our device in a clinical setting. You can see this gentleman has a skin lesion on the top of his head, and usually lidocaine is used to numb the region around the, the lesion. Our device is placed on the skin lesion and the visibility window is used to line the lesion up with the hole at the bottom of the device. The sphere is then rotated and the skin lesion is cut so that the sample ends up in the metal sphere. Forceps are then used to grab the skin sample and place it in a formulin tube to be sent to pathology. So this is our sponsor, Dr. Kang, using our device on an inanimate skin model. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Dr. Chen using our device on our professor, Dr. Allen, who had a um, small skin lesion on his neck. From her experience, she noticed that our device made a much more superficial cut than the razor and also prevented um, excessive bleeding. So for our testing procedure, we decided to focus on facial curvature and biological surfaces that would mimic um, 
locations that we would take skin samples from. So we used cadaver heads um, and took samples from the figure. <laughs> um, so the samples that we took are in red, and we wanted to target um, areas of bone, areas of fat, and areas of curvature. Go back, sorry. Um, to uh, mimic different areas that we would take, scam again, samples of. So we also varied our force, um, the pressure that we used to take the sample, um, to see if that would have any effect on pathological diagnosis. So we actually got pretty promising results from our testing. The image above shows you uh, the skin lesion that was taken from under the ear of the cadaver head. And the bottom image shows you the histology of the sample that was taken. The top image, the positive image, shows that we only took the epidermal layer, which is in the dark purple, and left um, in the negative image the dermal layer. As we look closer at the um, negative image, you can see that we actually cut right at the dermal epidermal junction. So as compared with the current standard of care, um, you can see from the top image that it takes much more skin than what is necessary for diagnosis and cuts into the dermal layer, which again causes excessive scarring and bleeding. Our device, as you can see, takes only the epidermal layer. So this is a predicted cost of our prototype in mass production. It's around $3.55 right now, but we hope to make this value lower as we look into more efficient ways to manufacture our products. So did we accomplish what we set out to do? Well, we were able to remove only the ep epidermal layer, as you saw in the pathology images shown. Um, we were able to protect doctors from razor cuts by the prototype design by housing our um, spherical blade in the cylindrical housing. And finally, we were able to maintain sufficient sample for diagnosis because even before we told our pathologist that we were taking cadaver skin, she was able to tell us that she diagnosed seborrheic keratosis. So for the future, we hope to, again, optimize manufacturing, um, incorporate containment, so maybe make it an all-in-one device where um, we could send the device, close it up, and send it straight to pathology. We'd like to do a pilot study on human scarring, and we'd also like to do a clinical study for um, determining if our device is effective in diagnosing skin conditions. We'd like to acknowledge the following people. And we are now open for questions. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. Yes. Yes. Um, if not, I'll try to speak up. Uh, discuss what types of materials you're going to think about producing, and would these materials make it feasible for you to make this device more disposable since you're dealing with human tissue, or are you thinking about autoclaving, these types of materials, and different types of razor materials, like ceramic uh, razors instead of metal razors? Um, well, we hope that the device will be disposable, and we've been looking at different types of um, spheres to, you know, sphere material, so we've looked at aluminum and steel, but right now we have been mostly concentrating on steel, and um, <laughs> One more? All right, very good. We'll stay on time. Thank you. Just as a uh, comment, I don't normally serve as a guinea pig. Uh, turns out I actually clinically needed that sample taken.